This is Eyewitness News up close. Long after the hit from this week's snowstorm, the tri-state and the rest of the Northeast will be feeling the big hit on taxes. This after President Trump signed the Republican-backed tax reform overhaul, a bill that drastically cut back state and local deductions for income and property taxes. Among the 20 Republicans who opposed the plan, that man, Congressman Peter King of Long Island. He joins us this morning on Up Close. Meanwhile, a little more than a week, in a little more than a week, Phil Murphy takes over as governor of New Jersey. Like President Trump, this will be Mr. Murphy's first elected office. So will he make drastic changes for the policies of the current Christie administration? This morning, we talked to one of Mr. Murphy's top political advisors. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Up Close. I'm Bill Ritter. Tax cuts for the wealthy and tax hikes for middle and upper middle class folks in the Northeast and California. That's the Trump tax reform bill. But it's not the only thing Congressman Peter King disagrees with President Trump about. He also doesn't much like how Mr. Trump trashes the FBI, which Congressman King supports the FBI. Mr. King joins us from his home this morning in Nassau County. Congressman, good morning. Thank you, Bill. Good and morning to you. Happy New Year to you as, as well. I want to talk about what's on everyone's mind as the new year begins, and that is taxes, state and local tax deductions, SALT. Uh, income taxes and property taxes. You are one of 20 Republicans who voted against this bill. Uh, you said because it's going to hurt your constituents. What happens now that the bill is law? Uh, actually, uh, we're going to try it any way we can to amend it. For instance, next week, uh, a Congresswoman Nita Lowy and I are going to introduce a bill which would restore SALT. Now, uh, listen, it's going to be tough to get that passed, but we want that on the table. And I know there's going to be a number of problems with the bill. There is with any tax bill uh, where they have to make technical changes, they have to make corrections. And we want to take advantage of every one of those technical changes to try to work our uh, reinstatement of SALT back into the code. Uh, this is just unfair to the Northeast. Now listen, a lot of my constituents are going to get a tax break, they're going to get a tax cut, but there's also going to be a good number who are going to get their taxes increased because they're going to lose the, uh, all of the deductions except for $10,000 for state income tax and local property tax. You could have a middle income person in my district, a uh, police officer and a teacher, a couple, and they could easily have uh, a combined tax of $25,000. And they can only now deduct 10000 of that. So uh, the rest of the country, most of the rest of the country is going to get a tax cut. But New York, New Jersey, California and Maryland are going to have a disproportionate number of people getting a tax increase. We have to, again, try to fight it every way we can. I know that Governor Cuomo here in New York is trying to find ways to work within the code so that uh, the deductions can still be available, maybe somehow work it out that uh, rather than an income tax, it will be a payroll tax, and that would still be deductible again. I'm not an accountant, but I've uh, urged the governor to try and do whatever can be yeah. done. If they're going to take away the one big deduction that people in the Northeast had, then we should use every uh, method we can to try to get around that. And we're not looking for any special favors here, Bill, because uh, we give, New York and New Jersey, give far more to the federal government than we get back. That money goes to other states. Like South Carolina gets about uh, $20 billion back more than they put in. Uh, and we lose over $20 billion mm -hmm. in New York. So that's just an example. Actually, we lose, uh, I think it's about $40, $40 billion we lose in, in New York every year going to the federal government, which goes to other states around the country. So they get the benefit of our money already, and now we're going to lose a tax deduction to finance a tax cut for the rest of the country. You, you're clearly it's, very passionate about it, Congressman, uh, Congressman King. The, the thing is, though, the reality is, is that your Republican colleagues uh, were passionate about doing this to people in the Northeast and getting rid of these deductions. And while some of the middle class in the Northeast uh, and the lower middle class might get a tax break of a couple thousand dollars at the maximum when this, with this new bill, there are a lot of people who are regular middle class and perhaps a little upper middle class in the Northeast who own property that is far more expensive than, let's say, the, the states in the middle of the country. Uh, and they're going to lose tens, as you said, tens of thousands of dollars. Your colleagues already said, sorry, Congressman King, this is how we're going to pay for it, and too bad about your constituents. They've already done that. How are you going to pass a, a, an amendment to this bill when they've already said no? 
As I said, it's not going to be easy. Uh, the only way to do it is if we can find some piece of legislation that has to pass, something that they need from us, and we can attach this and perhaps get part of it back. But I'm not overly optimistic, but I want to keep that fight up. So whenever there is an opportunity, I want to be ready to be able to move in. And if it works, mm -hmm. it works. If not, we have to just keep fighting as hard as we can. The Democratic governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, has already said he'd like to explore maybe getting rid of the state income tax and making it a payroll tax so that it would be tax deductible uh, to businesses, which are now paying a, a, lower, a lower rate. Listen, if they can make a payroll tax work, that's fine with me. I've, uh, I've, I've told the governor I will support whatever he can do. If, if it's, again, going to be accepted by the IRS, if we can make it work, yes. And I have no compunction in saying that because it's not that we're trying to get a special deal. We just want to be treated equally. And if this is what it takes to get it done, then I say do it. And I will support the governor. And I will support uh, you know, the Senate Majority Leader, John Flanagan. I'll support the Speaker, the Governor, whatever it takes to get it done. Because this should not be a Republican and Democratic issue. I realize Republicans voted that way in Congress. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, in New York, we should treat this as a New York issue, as I'm sure the people in New Jersey will. I mean, I've worked in, uh, in, uh, with people like Rodney Feelingheiser and Leonard Lance, Chris Smith, Frank Robiondo in New Jersey. They also voted against this bill because of that. So. We had five Republicans in New York, and I think four in New Jersey, and, w and we voted against the bill because of the damage it would do. And again, we don't want any special favors. We just want to be treated no, fairly, and we weren't treated fairly with this bill. Well, there's a reason I took so many minutes to talk about it, because uh, it affects a lot of people, and a lot of your constituents have already talked to their accountants, and they're not happy as this new year. But I do want to talk about some of the things involving President Trump. I want to start first with the FBI. You've seen a lot of FBI bashing by this White House. I know you're a big supporter of the FBI. What's your reaction to how the president has treated the Department of Justice and the FBI, especially how he's trashed them? Well, two things. One, I've always said that 99.9% .9 of the FBI agents are honorable, decent, patriotic, courageous uh, men and women who get the job done. However, Bill, there have been problems at the top. There are some decisions that were made by the FBI, which I think have to be looked into. They've not provided the Intelligence Committee with all the information we've been asking for. But I've said when we do make these criticisms, we should be doing it with a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. We have to make it clear that we're talking about uh, specific policies of individual people that we have questions about. But to just use the term FBI is very damaging. To me, it's just like if there's a police department and there's one or two things go wrong in the police department, you make it clear you're not attacking the police. You're attacking the one or two people or three people, whatever it is, that may have acted improperly or may have exercised bad judgment. But I... I am very proud of the fact that as Republicans, we've always been pro-police, pro-FBI, pro-CIA, and we have to keep that. And again, I, I'm, I'm on the Intelligence Committee, and there are real, there's some real issues that we have to raise, I believe, as far as what the FBI, certain people in the FBI did at certain times. But again, we're talking about a tiny, tiny percentage of people in the FBI. And again, these are questions. We have no definite answers on it. So mm -hmm. uh, if you notice, uh, again, I have joined in uh, some of the legal proceedings the Intelligence Committee has to get more information from the FBI, but I make it clear that those agents and those people and those supervisors who are uh, doing the job, I see what they do here in New York and New Jersey as far as uh, counterterrorism, as far as organized crime, as far as going after MS-13, they're doing a phenomenal job. Okay. Uh, let's talk uh, as well about the big news this last week, uh, the controversy over North Korea and the president tweeting out, uh, that he had a bigger nuclear button than the dictator, Kim Jong-un. How did you react to that? And have you ever seen a president uh, do that? And your whole reaction to sort of foreign policy being, being dished out via Twitter these days? Well, first of all, I think on North Korea, and this is where uh, Bill and I, you and I, may, uh, you and I may disagree on this, I think we, we have a chance of making progress in North Korea. The fact that... Uh, uh, Kim Jong-un has reached out now and wants to talk with South, South Korea. Korea yeah. That's actually positive because in the past he has refused to speak to South Korea saying he would only talk to the U.S. because he didn't recognize South Korea as being a government. So I think that uh, the, the embargo that's on the uh, uh, North Koreans is having an impact. The fact that the president keeps them on defense, you know, we'll, we'll know soon enough whether or not it's working. But I think it's, it, it has Kim Jong-un rattled a bit. And uh, the fact that the uh, embargo and the work that Nikki Haley, i got to give her tremendous credit, Ambassador Haley is doing a terrific job with the U.N. as far as mobilizing world support and uh, having economic restrictions and an embargo on North Korea. I think they are being weakened by it, 
but I think it's too early to claim any kind of victory. But I do see us making some slight progress with North Korea. Well, we're all hoping for some sort of diplomacy. Certainly no one wants a war. Finally, let me talk about uh, something that I, I know, I assume you think, you know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up, but it's, it's an interesting debate that we're having on a, on a, on a you know, politics and public affairs show on a Sunday morning in New York uh, uh, and the Tri-State. And that, that is about this book by the author, uh, uh, Mr. Wolf. Uh, fire and fury that really takes us supposedly as inside look inside the White House. You've seen the excerpts. Uh, some of it's kind of tawdry. Some of it's quite disturbing. Uh, and a lot of people, the bigger picture, a lot of people are saying, well, does this say that the president perhaps is not qualified to be president? That's what a lot of people who were Trump supporters even are saying. And certainly the debate between and the disagreements now between his former friend, the president's former friend and advisor, Stephen Bannon, and what Mr. Bannon said about treasonous behavior by the president's son meeting with the Russians. What's your reaction to some of these uh, allegations in the book? Well, if you, uh, you recall, it was last August. I think it was on this show. It was you, on this show, yes. I was, I think, the first national Republican to call for, Steve, for the president to fire Steve Bannon from the White House back in last August. I think he's been dangerous. I think he's been an impediment, not just to the president, but to American policy, leaking, uh, in effect, sabotaging international policies of the president, certainly, for instance, involving North Korea. So I think it's good to see Bannon is gone. I, uh, I, I think he should be basically isolated from the Republican Party and from politics altogether. As far as uh, what Bannon has said, as far as what he said about Donald Trump Jr., I've listened to all the testimony on that. And uh, to me, whether or not it was a mistaken judgment to meet is one thing. But to him to be using words like treason and uh, saying that this is going to uh, result in, could result in impeachment, Bannon is, is totally wrong. I, it, uh, to me, he's totally out of bounds. I think the president uh, thought there was some ability that Bannon had, and that's why he kept him on. Looking back at it now, I don't think you should have hired him in the first place. Okay. I think that uh, he's a self-promoter. And uh, as far as uh, I think it's unfair that I'll be saying the president is not fit for office. I, was, I've been with the president. Uh, he does things differently. Uh, he's uh, certainly more outgoing. He doesn't uh, do things the conventional way. But on the other hand, listen, we've had a very strong economy for the last year. We're making very good progress against ISIS, and I think we're starting to make some progress against North Korea, and our relationships with countries like Egypt and Jordan and Israel are as strong as they've ever been. So on balance, I think this has been a good year for the president, even though sometimes his tweets get in the way of people realizing what he's doing. If he, uh, but I guess at this stage of his life, it's hard to get the president to change his habits. Last, last I, my advice to him would be... If he could sort of, sort of stop tweeting, he'd be a lot better. Well, a lot of uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, agree with you on that. W one, one final thought about this. Uh, some of the allegations in the book, the president, you know, locking himself in his bedroom, not wanting anyone to change his sheets for fear of getting uh, poisoned or contaminated, and then just sitting there eating hamburgers from McDonald's at 6.30 while watching television. Did, your reaction to that, did that disturb you at all? Well, first of all, I've never seen that aspect of the president. And again, if we're relying on, uh, again, anonymous sources, I remember hearing things about Bill and Hillary Clinton, even to some extent about President Obama. Uh, certainly we hear a lot now about John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson. I, uh, again, all I know is the president uh, has achieved a tremendous amount in his life. Uh, he's made a lot of money. He's running a, uh, he's run a, uh, a massive real estate empire, and, he's, and he became elected president of the United States against one of the strongest okay. fields we ever had. So I think a lot of this is just gossip that's out there. And again, talking to people who work with him every day, and not that I see him that often, but I've been at the White House in small meetings with him. He's on top of his game, and I'm confident that he uh, is uh, fully able and up to the job. People can disagree with his policies. They can disagree with his style. But I think it's wrong to say that there's anything that's uh, wrong with the president or that, uh, to me, uh, uh, that, that's just uh, really uh, amateur you know, psychology. And I can go in any direction you wanted to. Always appreciate your perspective, Congressman Peter King. Coming up, Democrats about to retake control of the governor's office in New Jersey after eight years of Republican Chris Christie. So what can we expect from Phil Murphy in his first elected office job ever? We talked to one of the incoming governor's top advisors. That's next.